The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's Moore as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Good evening and welcome back to The Blueprint. This is Lowe's Moore. Man, I'm really psyched, uh, you know, this evening. You know, I, I took the show on the road. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago and, you know, I, I did the show from there. It went, it, it, it went great. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was exciting. It was beautiful in, in, in Charlotte. And, and then, you know, I jumped in the car on, uh, I did that on Sunday, jumped in the car on Thursday and went down. I was visiting my wife's family on the first part of the trip and, and, uh, doing a little house cleaning, um, from my wife's aunt. And in about three or four days, we were able to, you know, clean out a house and prepare it for someone to move in. And then on Thursday, we jumped in the car and went down to Fayetteville, North Carolina, where my both my brothers, uh, Doug and Kurt, are in Fayetteville. And I had the opportunity to hang out with them and 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 fa their families. And, and man, it was just awesome, man, just to kind of get away and break the monotony of what's happening in the pandemic. And then I was able to do the show in my brother's man cave, man. We just took the show on the road, man. And, and that was exciting. So, man, I'm glad to be back home. And knowing that we are going through this process of spring, you know, I, I think we all jumped a few years, last few years. I think we jumped right out of winter into summer, right? And I think we're a little shocked that we haven't jumped right into uh, summer right now. But uh, it's going through, seems like, you know, your normal uh, spring where it's going to rain. Everything starts to turn green. I see some of my flowers in the front yard starting to bud. And um, I'm always sitting outside watching them open up. And today open up fully and taking pictures every year and and so i look forward to spring and i look forward to summer and you know uh this is well baseball time man when you get to april you know end of march coming into april man you get into you know what we call america's game right uh baseball right and and you know i don't know if we uh, I'm going to get right into it. I don't know if we have the picture, a picture. I'm going to show you a picture, you know, because that's where I started uh, before basketball. I started out in baseball. You see me there on my little uh, minor league team. <laughs> that's the crew from back in the day, man. I, I think I had a little bit of potential back then uh, to play a little baseball. There, there I'm right there, man, looking, looking mean, man, and getting ready to play, man. And, and, you know, I, if, I don't know if many of you guys know me, right. Um, I'm sure my kids and my wife, my mom could tell you is one thing I, I never, you know, I, I never hated, I hated to lose, man. I always wanted to win, but I hated to lose. And I got to give, uh, you know, a shout out to my grandfather because, you know, when I, every summer, my mom used to send us down when I was, when I was younger, used to send us down to uh, Plymouth, North Carolina. And, you know, I had, I didn't even know any different, but my, my grandfather was an avid baseball fan. And, it, and around where he lived, man, they was always out on the field playing baseball, the softball. And we would watch on a black and white TV, we would watch baseball. We watch baseball all the time. And that's where I got my passion to play, to, uh, to, to play baseball. And, uh, you know, as I got older, you know, I wanted to I, I wanted to get involved with something that went all year round. And so that's when, you know, I started playing a little football. You know, of course, our parents bought us the little football helmets and the Jets was doing well at the time. And I don't tell my age, but the Jets was doing well. And Joe Namath uh, was playing. And then I think Fran Tockerton was with the Giants at that time before he was traded. And, I, you know, 
and but it was baseball, baseball, baseball. And, you know, I couldn't wait. I got to tell this real quick. <laughs> My grandfather came up and I was made I was made the pitcher. Right. I was made the pitcher and I was doing well in practice, you know, pitching the ball well, throwing the ball across the plate. And my grandfather came up, man. I was so excited to pitch when my grandfather came up. And man, I, I'm sorry to say, man, I, I, I ended up losing, right? 18 to zero. Everybody, I think everybody on the team got a hit off me. Or, and and man, you talk about a guy, man, who hates to lose. And 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 man, when that game was over, man, I just cried. I, I just cried and cried and cried for hours, man. My grandfather was trying to console me. And and I was like, man, I'm sorry, granddaddy. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm terrible, you know. And 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 then he went back to North Carolina and I got another chance to pitch. And I, I pitched a one hitter and we won 18 to zero. And so I made up for my 18 to zero loss with 18 to zero win and had a decent pitching, uh, played all around the, the different spots and had a great time. So this is we're going to be talking about baseball, family and, and baseball tonight. And, and so let me jump right into this. That's my that's my story about baseball. And and and, and of course, that time I you see the colors, the Nick colors, and they're doing great. They're like one nine in a row. I got my Nick colors and I got my Mets colors because I was a Mets fan growing up, man, with Tom Seaver, Bud Harrelson, because he was left handed. And then there was Willie Mays. And there was so many great, great players uh, on the Mets back then, man. And it was just it was just awesome as a little kid to watch. I was pitching my little my little baseball cards and eating my bubble gum, man. Man, so that's why I'm excited tonight to to get a flashback and talk about baseball, talk about a game that I loved back in the day. So let's let's get started, man. I want to start off with the with the book of the week, right? Uh, when I was with the Boys and Girls Club as the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club, went to a national conference for Boys and Girls Clubs of America, and uh, it so happened that Jackie Robinson's daughter was there, Sharon Robinson. And I got I have this book somewhere in my house called Promise to Keep. And uh, she, you know, she wrote about wrote about her father. She signed the book for me um, that at that time. And it, it actually, you know, I read it a couple of times. Man, It is a great read. So if you get an opportunity, man, to, uh, you know, to get that book, uh, a promise to keep. It's a great read. And there are many, many great things. Uh, Jackie Robinson, a number of people have written about Jackie Robinson over the years. I don't know if you have that. Uh, I got I think I got a picture up there with two bronze giant bronze statues right there. Yeah, I was in Here's my one of my Jackie. This is my Jackie Robinson story. I was in uh, Pasadena, California, visiting my son, Stan in Pasadena. And in the middle, late night, we flew in. And 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 next thing you know, um, I was asking my wife, I looked down the street, and I way down the street, and I just seen something down there, man. I didn't know what it was. And I was intrigued by it. And so intrigued that when I got up in the morning, my wife and I got some breakfast, and we walked down, and there was like two 30-foot heads of Jackie and Matt Robinson and all around in a circle it tells the story of 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 Mac and also Jackie and you notice that Jackie he's facing towards Brooklyn right it, they got a diagram that he's facing towards Brooklyn and Mac is facing towards California and you know the story of Mac and Jackie and all the things that they accomplished, if you can look in their hair, if you walk around, you see in their hair, everything that they accomplished is in the in their hair, in the back in the back of their head and at the top of their hair. It was it was just an awesome experience. And that that, you know, that same evening, I got a chance to see the movie 42. So, uh, yeah, just an awesome read. Um, and, and so now let me get to uh, my word of the week is promise. Right. Just like a promise to keep. Right. Promise. Right. Never make a promise that you can't keep. It's important uh, to understand 
when I make a promise, when I make a vow, like, like marriage, when I made a promise to my wife, I made a vow to my wife. And here we are going 38 years, almost 39 years as a, as, as a couple, right? Uh, so, hey, when you make a promise, you have to have the ability to keep it, right? And I always say that a man is, we used to shake hands back in the day, right? And, 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 and then we used to say something with our mouth Right. And they said, you know, we only as good as our word. Keep your promises. And then I have an affirmation. Yeah. Keep your promise. You know, I have an af affirmation here uh, from this is the Hill and Pierce Harper. My good friend Hill and his son Pierce, you know, started the affirmation and quote moment. It says, promise yourself to stress less, smile more, to have strength and courage to venture out of your own comfort zone, to leave your post behind, your past behind, leave your past behind you and appreciate this moment. Most importantly, promise yourself always to live a life you truly want to live. Live a life you truly want to live and put your past behind you and appreciate every moment so i'm thankful for 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 that affirmation or that quote and and since i was talking about jackie robinson we're going to have a jackie robinson moment right now they just celebrated uh jackie robinson day i think it was april 15th And what does the 42 mean? The man who wore it gave them the one thing that no one at the time could ever have done. He gave them equality and he gave them opportunity. Jackie Robinson's breaking of the color barrier for black folk was equivalent to the first man landing on the moon. He was literally going to be carrying 21 million black folk on his back. First and foremost, and more importantly, is it brings attention to it because, um, really? you know, it, everyone should know who Jackie Robinson is. Uh, you know, he stands for a lot more than just baseball. I mean, uh, even if you're not a baseball fan, you should be aware of, of what uh, he means. Well, I wouldn't be playing if it wasn't for Jackie Robinson. He's an honorable man who changed the perception of how people open the gateway to play, everybody to play Major League Baseball, and he's a great honor. Jackie Robinson didn't fight back. He had to hold his temper, if you will. He was a very proud man, and he got the job done. And all of us are beneficiaries because of that. He has as much to do with the civil rights movement, civil rights, not just baseball, as any human being that ever, ever was a United States citizen. It's amazing what he did. You realize how important he actually is. The most important person in baseball, without a question, and the most important person in American sports. There's no way I could mount a pitch in Yankee Stadium and be pitching for my race. Like the way that those guys were thinking about, you know, the next generation and the guys coming behind them while playing the, mo the hardest sport in the world. Without these guys, there is no need. Let's say he was alive today. He would be in his 90s. The things he might have been able to accomplish. Because even though the civil rights movement was moving in the right direction, think of all the things that have happened between 72 and now and how his insight and what he meant to the, to the community at large, how much work he might have been able to do if he didn't die at such a young age. When you look at how far we have come since 1947, you just look around. Major League Baseball is now a worldwide entity. You have players from all over the world. And it all started back in 1947 on April the 15th. Thank you, Jackie. Today, I think every American should say a special word of thanks to Jackie Robinson. Wow, that's awesome. And yeah, just the just the awesome, awesome. Jackie Robinson was awesome, man. And you know, I'm gonna introduce my uh I got two guests this evening, 
and both of them are members of the New York Mets staff. And I want to start out with Roy Smith. All right, I'm going to invite Roy on, and we're going to show a little clip of Roy right now. Roy, how you doing, man? Good, Lowe's. Good to be out here, buddy. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for coming on, man. And, and you know, quickly, I just got a quick question for you before we bring on Donovan here. Can you still get that leg up there? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, yeah, that, that kind of came gradually. I, uh, you know, it's a way to keep your weight back when you're pitching. I certainly wasn't like that when I was in high school. But when I see pictures of myself, I, um, it, it, it didn't feel that that's how high I brought my leg, but it seems like every baseball card I had, that's what they uh, focused on. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's bring in uh, Donovan, Donovan Mitchell also. And Donovan, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Lowe's. How you doing? Hey, Roy, how's it going? Hey, how you doing, buddy? Doing good. Yeah. Doing good. So before we get started, man, I want to ask you a couple of, uh, you know, talk a little bit about um, Jackie Robinson. And I know that each year, you know, I, I, I only go to a few Mets games a year, but I'm always um, excited about the display that you guys have of Jackie Robinson. I mean, I'm always impressed. Love reading the words. Um you know, the memory of Jackie Robinson. Talk, talk a little bit about, uh, and, you know, Mont Vernon had a little connection to Jackie with uh, with Ralph Brinker uh, being on the Brooklyn Dodgers as a pitcher um, with Jackie Robinson, a real good friend of Jackie Robinson. And so talk to me a little bit about, uh, about Jackie. Well, um, I know that I, I wouldn't be playing this game. I wouldn't be in this game if it wasn't for my grandfather who, who um, basically knew a lot about Jackie Robinson and understood what he went through to get to this point. And it, it was, it was more than baseball. Like, like um, the preview that you had, it was more than baseball. He, he was civil rights. He was, he was what was right in America. And it was about giving someone a chance and he could not fail. He had to do it for, his, uh, he had to do it for America, but he was basically representing uh, a people, a race that had been treated unfairly. And the things that he had to go through, the, the way he had to keep his cool and, and to keep his, himself together, um, he couldn't fail. And I think some of that stress might might have, uh, you know, you know, really hurt him later on in life, but. It could have been anyone. It could have been Satchel, it could have been Josh, but I think they, they made the right decision to go with Jackie and, and and he held it down. And, you know, we wouldn't be playing this game today if it wasn't for uh, his contributions. Awesome. It, 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 it's truly mind boggling what, what the man had to go through. And it's, um, you know, shameful in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, those, I, I did not know this, but Ralph, was Ralph Franco was a um, pallbearer at Jackie Robinson's funeral. Uh, they were that close. Um, and, uh, you know, I spent two years in the, in the front office with the Dodgers, and, and uh, obviously Vince Scully was around the team all the time, the great, the great announcer. And he talked about Jackie Robinson a little bit. I asked him some questions about him, and he was very close with, uh, with Jackie and, and his wife. And uh, Don Newcomb, the great pitcher from back then, would, would stop him just every once in a while. So, um, but again, uh, the other, the other, the other fact not talked about was what a great all-around athlete he was. Um, played football at UCLA, played basketball, and I believe he ran a track. Yes. Uh, you know, and and you know, Donovan, I was thinking, you know, as we were prepping for this, you know, we we don't do a great job holding on to you know recruiting minorities in baseball as it is. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that, and some of it is the 
specialization in sports now, but would would today would we have kept Jackie Robinson in the game? You know, would he have gone to football or basketball? You know, um, that's I, I was thinking about that as we were talking because baseball was king back then, and it's it is no longer. The other thing is, um, uh, you know, it, it's a longer path to the pros in baseball. It is. You know. It definitely um, is, and you know the, these these high school these young kids coming up today. You know, you turn on the TV, you see the LeBron Jameses, you you see the, you see the Donovan Mitchells, you see the you know the, right out of college they're in the NBA or the, in the in a NFL, and it and it seems like it's 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 right away. It happens right away. And with baseball, um, we don't we don't really show too much of college game as much. Um, and then when guys finally get there, um, it's two years, it's three years, it's four years. For some guys, it's seven years in the minors before they finally get an opportunity. And, um, you know, I think we need to do a better job of, of promoting the game, especially at the amateur level. Yeah, no, and, and part of it's specialization. I'd, I'd ask you two guys, too. Um, I know it bothers me um, as, a, as a scout. Um, I like to know that a kid played another sport, you know, um, I, I think it, it rounds you. It gives you a competitive instinct um, that transcends. I know for me, playing basketball at Mount Vernon High, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how much it helped me until later, you know, in my career in baseball when I got to the big leagues and got to AAA, where the the talent kind of evened out on me. And um, that wasn't the first time that I wasn't the big, the big fish, you know. I, I by playing Mount, by playing on those great teams in Mount Vernon, I I got a, I, I I had to you know live being a small fish in a big pond, you know, and, and playing with those guys. And I didn't realize, you know, I mean, like I said, when I had to start figuring things out, um, it wasn't the first time I had to do it. I was I tell people all the time when I was playing there, games were the easier part. Practice was at times humiliating to me. <laughs> um, there, was, you know, there was two NBA players. I mean, when, guy, when we played, when we ran that eleven man drill, I would, I would hope that I didn't get the bounce pass on the wing because that ball, <laughs> that ball, was getting, I mean, that ball was getting pinned. You know, there was no doubt about. It. Um, you know, Coach Shore kept telling me, "Hey, you just go up strong, you lay it up." But you know, I, I didn't realize how much that experience helped me later in baseball. It was very. Yeah. And um, I want to, before we kind of move on, I want to see if I can just pop this up here because this is really the only picture I gave it to my son, right? Um, was the only picture I think I, at a uh, auction that I bid it on. I mean, I bid it on some things in the past, right? I didn't, I, I didn't think I was going to actually win this, you know, win the bid. Cause I was thinking, like, man, some it got to be some rich people in here. <laughs> but uh, it was, you know, for Jackie, farewell to to forty two, and of course, Mariano Rivera um, was the last person to wear the number forty two, and I was able to get get this great, <laughs> you know, this great auction item, and and. Uh, you know, I gave it to my son Isaiah. I had my wife just bring it down, man, because I thought it was appropriate, man, to to, to have. And it's just a beautiful piece. All right, I'm not telling you where I live, so nobody can come over here and <laughs> <laughs> and try to heist that one from me. You know, <laughs> but um, so so just before I ask you about your families, and Roy was talking about, um, you know, my Vernon, right? And Donovan, I promised Donovan tonight I was going to get him a Mount Vernon High School. Uh, I'm going to get you some Mount Vernon High School gear. Let's put it that way. And there you go. There you have, go. But, and Roy was talking about being on the high school team. So I think we got a picture of Roy on, on the high school team right there. And, uh, of course, if you look in the back, there go Roy right there in the back next to number 30 number 35 and then you know tony frantino who eventually coached with the miami heat when they first came in and then number you can't really see it but it was i think it was like 43 and rodney 43. mccray 43. And, 43. And, yeah. yeah and scooter and scooter mccray 
you know, uh, this this was a, a a great team. Eventually, my brother came on onto the team, and 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 uh, they won some championships, man. But yeah, there go Roy, and his, he got some he had some Mount Vernon gear on, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I need that Mount Vernon stuff. Yeah. Yeah, some, well, some t-shirts and some some hoodies. Uh, I'm definitely rocking it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna. I'm definitely gonna get you get you some gear. And then um, uh, Donovan, when boy, when Donovan was little, a uh, young man, I remember him. Uh, I, you know, I thought that somewhere down the road I was gonna get an opportunity to coach him, uh, but he was a little little guy then, you know, and he he came into the Boys and Girls Club program. At, at the and and basketball program for for a minute and uh you know i don't know i hopefully had a, a good experience uh the, the gentleman who was running who was running at the time calvin jones we call cj little guy he's about as big as the kids you know running it at that time passed away just uh maybe a few weeks ago um you know he's gonna be sorely missed but the next time i remember hearing from hearing about Donovan, you called me up and said, Hey Lowe's, you know, Donovan got a, a full scholarship to to Louisville. I was I was thinking in my head, what did Donovan do from the time I seen him as a little kid? <laughs> I was like, what? How tall is Donovan? I was thinking in my head, how tall is Donovan? What what happened? You know? But uh yeah, that was I was so proud, man. I know you were proud as a father, but I was proud, man, because yo, that's that's that was awesome, man. I was telling everybody, I said, yo, Donovan made he's a he got a full scholarship to because we we are always pushing for our kids, right? To it's particularly to be good student athletes and, and position themselves if they have a gift right to go to college man and and uh that i'm sure that you were proud and that's awesome so both of you guys i'm gonna start with uh donovan but both of you guys talk about the importance one of the things about the blueprint i talk about right because everybody has a blueprint one of the things i talk about in the blueprint is the importance of faith no the importance of family the importance of faith and the importance of education so uh donovan talk a little bit about uh, about that in terms of your your parents, you know, growing up and into, you know, fatherhood? Well, you know, I, I grew up, um, you know, my, my mom wasn't, I didn't stay with my mom. I stayed with my grandmother. And, um, you know, sometimes you're, you're put in certain situations as a, as a young kid that you don't really understand right away. Um, and, you know, for, for years, I didn't understand why I wasn't with my mom. But, you know, after talking with my sister and, I, and really just starting to understand myself as an adult, I understood what my parents, uh, what my parents had to go through. So I understood my my mom a little bit more as I got older in age. Um, as far as family, fam, family's big for me. And the the one thing about the game of baseball, um, and and even though I wouldn't change it to this day, it took me away from family. Um, it took me away from my friends. It took me away from my kids. It took me away from my wife at the time um, for six months out of the year. And, you know, every time I came home, it was like trying to catch up. Um, so that 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 relationship that you're looking to build was always severed because of baseball season. And as much as I had this dream of being a major leaguer or a major league coach, it never really allowed me to to really get into that that fatherhood like I really really wanted to. Um, so I, I think as much as I love the game, I really understand that you know it takes a strong family background. It takes it takes a lot to keep that family background together. Um, and and I and I have to give a shout out and say that you know when I was way down to his mother did an outstanding job of, of, of keeping that structure there when it wasn't, when it wasn't easy. Um, but when I came home, you know, one of the things I made sure I did was I made sure I would go to each game that Donovan or Jordan had, or make sure I would be at recitals or make sure that I would be at plays um, because that was important. And to let them know that, Hey, I was there, even though it's sometimes it's hard, 
Um, but it, it, it was tough. But, um, you know, my, my kids mean mean the world to me, and, and they both know it. Wow. Awesome. Um, Roy? Well, in terms of um, faith, I, uh, the people from Mount Vernon listening, uh, my parents were both born in Mount Vernon and attended um, Trinity Church on the south side and got married there. And then they settled in Fleetwood. So um, we, growing up, I attended the um, Church of the Ascension, the Episcopal Church over on Crary Avenue. Yes. Um, I got uh, got confirmed at the uh, Cathedral of St. John of the Vine downtown. So um, my, my father was very active in the church, um, really, really loved the church community. Um, uh, he was the superintendent of, of, the, of the church school on Sundays, uh, was on the vestry. My mother was in the bell choir. My sister and I both um, sang in the choir. We were both um, acolytes. Um, so that, that was very important to me growing up. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was lucky, you know, I, listening to Donovan, I, I, I almost heard my father talking. Um, I was lucky. My, my father passed when I was 19 years old, but I, was, I had the best father in the world. He was, his father didn't attend his games, and, and that always hurt him. Um, and he, he was determined to be a better father to me and my sister than he, his father was to him. So we were the, we were the beneficiaries of that. So I, I, I've always considered myself very lucky. Uh, my mother was, you know, you know how mothers are. Right? <laughs> my mother's the best in the world. Um, so that has always, always been very important to me. Um, you know, them supporting me during, during baseball. And then, you know, Donovan, Speaking of, of the time away from your kids, I, you know, I got married not until my 30s. Uh, after I pretty much I played one year as a married man, um, I, I, I there's no way I would have been able to handle, um, you know, being married and fatherhood while I was playing. And then you know we made the decision not to have children because you know part of it was the decision on both of us. But the thing about baseball is it's 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 not you can't do it halfway you know it, you're, you're either all in or you're not and it's just been part of my blood and i have no regrets but i, I donovan i i i don't I, I know how difficult it must have been because i just i just accepted the fact that i wouldn't be able to do it you know yeah and and real quick just you know i i remember going out to utah i think it was it was last year um and i was sitting down with donovan we, we were talking and I asked him, I said, do you think I was disappointed that you didn't stick with baseball? And he said, yeah. And I said, Donovan, I said, you got to remember during baseball season, I wasn't around. So I really didn't get a chance to watch him play baseball. So I was happy when he chose basketball because I knew I would be able to see him. <laughs> yeah. If he would have got drafted playing baseball, you know, unless they were playing the Mets, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to see him. So, right. um, I was. Hey, I don't think he knew it, but when I told him, I was like, I was so glad that you chose basketball and it was what you wanted to do because I never. I think I probably saw him play two or three baseball games in in um, when he was at Canterbury Prep and, and one maybe one game at um, Greenwich Country Day. Yeah. I mean, I'm, my wife was a flight attendant, so even now she can she can <laughs> fly wherever. I, well, she doesn't she doesn't fly to any small minor league cities, but she flies to San Francisco and L.A. You know, <laughs> she was, but but it, it's helped. You know, it's helped a lot, and um, I, I definitely can relate to what you're, you know, what you had to have gone through. Yeah, and Roy Roy is visiting us this evening from Arizona, so we, he's three hours. You know, it's probably nighttime here, man, and daytime <laughs> <laughs> in yeah. a different kind of weather too. <laughs> we yeah, I'm worried about right. spring there, you know. <laughs> I'm alone in a hotel room, which is going to be my pretty much my existence through uh, through the summer. Wow, yeah, I mean that that is a tough uh, you know a tough experience. I was coming to the close of mine, uh, you know, when I got married. You know, I was still in the my I was playing in the CBA, and my wife and I, you know, got married, and we we had our my oldest daughter, and then while I was in Albany, we had a another door so he was young and so i was still on the road it you know it wasn't an nba season right it wasn't an nba season but um you know it it, it still hurt 
you know, not to see your wife and not to see your kids and, you know, stuff like that. And I was very fortunate because my career had ended, you know, by the time my kids got really into elementary school, right? And I had an opportunity to, uh, when Phil Jackson got the job with the Chicago Bulls, I interviewed for the job. And, and so I had a lot of opportunities to, to get in the NBA because uh, Sat, remember uh, Sat Sanders, right? Sat Sanders with the Boston Celtics. He was in charge of, uh, you know, prepping guys for NBA coaching. And he used to call me up every year, ask me if I was still interested in coaching in the NBA. And uh, so the decision to go home to the to the Boys and Girls Club and become the executive director over a coach because I had first researched it. I asked uh, Phil Jackson, Bill Musselman, George Call, talk to me about coaching. And every one of them, every one of them talked about not knowing when their kids started to walk, uh, when they graduated from elementary school. I mean, all those things. And see, I grew up in a single parent home, so my dad was never really there. Right. So it, it was just easy to make the decision to come back home and go to the Boys and Girls Club because I I I see everything. I see everything my kids did. I was at I was at everything. And I tell you, that's the greatest blessing in the world is to see your kids grow up. You know, it's yeah. just just awesome. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, getting into the getting into baseball talk to me a little bit about education did you have to go to college you went straight into baseball talk, talk to me a little bit about the importance of education and the, and the experience that you had you want to kick it off roy yeah oh. kick it off, roy well i mean i i signed out of high school uh i i was a high pick at a high school um so uh it was a little bit of a tough decision because i i i, I had signed my letter of intent to go to stanford and, um, you know, my father, uh, you know, um, kind of represented me. We, you know, it was way before the big money in the draft and stuff. And, you know, we put a, we put a decent number on, on buying me out of college. In the end, I decided to sign with the Phillies. But one thing I'm, I'm extremely proud of is I attended college in the off season. And um, I kind of, you know, it took me about 10 years, but um, went to intercession classes at Iona attended one full semester at Fordham and then the people at Mercy, I, I found out they had quarters in their night school. So I just kept plugging away, plugging away. The people there were great. And I wound up getting my uh, degree um, be right before, right about the time that I, my, I finished playing. I, my first year in uh, my first year scouting, I did the Northeast for the Pirates in, uh, for the amateur draft. And um, uh I got my degree then and actually ended up halfway to my MBA when I moved out to Arizona when the Pirates asked me to move. So it's something I'm, I'm very, very proud of. Um, and, uh, you know, that I talk to kids about that all the time. I, and my, my father constantly talked to my sister and I about, about having options, you know, and that's the most important thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, create options for yourself, not, you know, so where you, Take a job because you want to, not because you have to, um, and and that was drummed into our heads. And now, you know, I was motivated from. I, I think it's it's fortunate I grew up where I did because the guys I grew up with, while my career was winding down, they were working on Wall Street now making big money. You know, and I was I was getting out of or possibly getting out of baseball, having to start at the bottom. You know, and that was a motivator for me. I didn't want I didn't want you know, not that any job is menial, but you know not strive to be the best I can be and have somebody point at me and say, you know, he could have went to Stanford, you know? Um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm very pr proud of that. Yeah. And before Donovan goes, uh, my wife wanted me to tell you, she was proud of you, man, Roy. And, and uh, you know, you did, she said you did my Vernon well. <laughs> well thank you. That's, that's, you did my Vernon well. So that's important to me. <laughs> Donovan. Yeah. Well, um, I started, you know, I went to Hamilton High School, a small school in Elmsford, and was lucky enough to get um, a chance to go to University of North Carolina at Charlotte, where, and, and I always tell this story, and I, and I make sure I tell this story to the young kids. Um, 
I was a I was a subpar student. Um, got to the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, and it wasn't like Hamilton High School where there was ten to fifteen kids in a the class. There was I was in a lecture hall. I, I was in there with uh, 60, 70, 80 kids. And it wasn't about raising your hand, getting that one-on-one -on -one attention. It was more about making an appointment with the professor to go and, and go and see him. So I was, I was, a, I was a big fish. A, I was a small fish in a big pond or vice versa. Uh, so school intimidated me. Um, I ended up nearly failing out of uh, college and, and lost my scholarship and just really struggled. Uh, my baseball coach um, told me that, hey, if you, you get your work done and, and get a chance to come back, we will up your scholarship. And I got to give a shout out to Gary Robinson who kept his promise because I, I hit the books. Like I've never hit the books before. Got focused, got myself back in. And two years later, I was drafted by Houston. Um, when I finished, um, my baseball career and started working in the front office with the Mets and coaching, I ended up going back to Drexel uh, University to, to try to finish up. But um, it's, it's been important. Um, like Roy said, it opens the doors. It gives you options. Um, you want to be able to tell someone no rather than them telling you no. And um, any young youth team that I talk to, any team that I coach, I really talk about the importance of education. I remember when Donovan was being recruited by a lot of a lot of schools, the first thing these coaches were saying to him, they didn't ask him about your defense. They didn't ask him about how he dribbled the ball. They didn't ask him about anything basketball. The first thing they said was, how are your grades? Mm. So, um, you know, and, and I used to tell Don, and I don't know if he remembers this, but I said, how can you – let I said you no one can stop you on the court, but you're gonna let your English teacher stop you. <laughs> I said that's the only person who can stop you. So um and and it was really pushed. His his mom ended up uh, working at Greenwich Country Day. I ended up working up at Hamilton High School as a permanent sub for about 13 years. So I, I was able to be around a lot of the kids and, and really talk education and talk sports and everything that I had gone through. So it, it's really important, and I was able to give back to my community by being there. And I actually had a chance to coach basketball at Hamilton. That's where I, that's where I met your wife, and and, and she she um she told me how to coach a girls basketball team. <laughs> Some of the things that she was telling me, I can't say on on the podcast, but um, um, it was awesome just getting to know her and to understand how to to coach girls basketball as well as boys basketball and the importance of having a male figure in their lives and especially a black male figure. And I was able to do that. And I was glad I was able to uh, affect some lives. Man, I'm proud of you, uh, Donovan. You, you said you coached the girls. Yeah, I coached, um, I think it was four or five years. And I actually, um, I remember we were Owen. <laughs> I hate to say we were 0 and 17 in the class D, and I think they only had four teams in, in that division. And the first the first place team or third place team would have had a bye at the county center. So I told my girls, I said, you know what? They're asking us if we want to play. I said, we're gonna go play. So we took an 0 and 17 team into the county center. And I remember asking, uh being asked by a reporter, why would you bring your team? to the county center after losing you know, all 17 games. I said, well, the team that we would have played in the first round, we lost to them by five points each. And I said, there was a game that we played against Ramapo High School where they beat us <laughs> 68 to five. Ooh. And I called practice the next day and all the girls showed up. And I said, you know what? They need to be on the big stage for their parents to see. It's not about winning the game. It's about being on the big stage and saying, hey, I played at the county center. So um, it was great. Uh, the next year I had some uh, some really talented players. And I was actually the, named the coach of the year that year. So it, it went well. <laughs> wow. OK, OK. Because yeah. yeah, I, 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 I was with Coach Cimino for about five or six years. Mm -hmm. And my wife got the head coaching job at the high school. I said, well, I'm going to go help my wife out. Um, it didn't last long. Girls were different. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
and my wife worked like an hour away, right? So I would I would say to the girls, all right, you know, coach is gonna be here shortly. Why don't you start getting ready? Right. And they sat in a circle and started having a conversation, right? Like they ignored me, you know, <laughs> like they start talking about the boy or whoever they were talking about. I said, do, do you got hear what I said? You know, Coach Moore's going to come in and she's going to start screaming if you guys are not getting ready. And she, you're not already ready when she walked through that door. And they just looked up at me and they kept doing what they was doing. I was like, man, so my coaching career with the girls didn't last that long. Man. Lose, so, look, look, I salute you, man. Lose, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story that um, that team that went 0 and 17 right before we went to the county center. What we did was we had our last practice in Hamilton. And what I did was I passed the ball around. We all sat on the ground. I passed the ball. And every person that had the ball had to tell something about the season. And it got to our, our, our senior, our captain. And she started talking and everybody in that in that gym was, was crying. And I said, man, we just had a team cry together. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it was a lot different. But, um, you know, I, I love that team and, and uh, it had a lot of fun. Yeah. So uh, so Roy, talk to me a little bit about uh, what you are currently doing and how did you get in it? And, you know, and how do you like it? I mean, you know. Uh, it's been my life, and, and and the transition from playing to, to to what I'm doing now was was almost instantaneous. I I uh, I signed with the Pittsburgh Pirates and played AAA with them in 1993, and um, I won 15 games. I, I you know I'd been to the big leagues. I I had gotten all my big league time by then, and they didn't call me up, and I was actually pretty perturbed at the end of the year. But I was 31. You know, and they were a rebuilding team. They didn't need a guy like me. But um, I actually criticized the organization at the end at the end of the year, and they turned around and offered me a, a scouting job. Um, so I had, I had some feelers to go to Japan, and it's not like it is now. Back then, it was kind of like one agent that was getting players over there, and I got a little frustrated there because there were guys making over there making big money that, that didn't have close to my big league time. So, you know, I thought about it and thought about it. I could have, could, could have hung on and had some offers to pitch AAA again the following year. But, you know, it just – I thought, geez, I, I, could, I could go from an old guy to a young guy overnight, you know. So um, I, uh, I took a job as an as area scout, which meant I, I covered college and high school in the Northeast. My, my area went from uh, New York City up through New England. Uh, after that year, the Pirates asked me to move out to Arizona um, because there was more players there and stuff, and the, and the area had opened up. So I took that, um, and I just kept I just kept getting promoted. I, I, I got into the pro side of scouting and then got elevated to assistant GM, um, which I was with the Pirates and then with the, the Los Angeles Dodgers. And, um, you know, for most of the last 10 years with the Mets, I've, I've done um, kind of special assignment stuff, big league stuff, kind of been a point, man. And, uh, I, I do enjoy it. I, I love being at the ballpark. Uh, even now, um, it, it's getting a little monotonous now. I can't wait for this, you know, to get the season going in terms of the minor leagues. But seeing young players and trying to project on how good they'll be is, is still a thrill for me. It's still, it's still an interesting part of the game. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Um, Donovan? Well, right now I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the New York Mets. Um, it's a job that I took over and or we started towards the end of June, beginning of July. Um, it's a very important role for the, for the organization. Um, it's one where we're, we're trying to make the culture of the New York Mets um, inclusive. Uh, comfortable for everyone to work in. And, you know, we, we've taken some hits in the media and everything else, but, you know, our, our new ownership is outstanding. Um, I, I love the people that, that I'm working for. And they're all about making everyone feel included. Like everyone's a part of what we're going to do. And everyone's going to have a say as far as moving this organization to another level. And it's going to be my job to, to um, help out with, you know, you know, maybe talk with 
our HR department about policies, talked to them about recruiting, talked about, about bringing in more diverse uh, candidates to um, for, for jobs. So I'm excited about it. I feel like I'm in a position where I can make change and, and I can really help our organization. Um, and, and I used to be in player relations. Mm -hmm. um, that was fun because I, I actually got a chance to go on the field and be with the players and, and still be a part of the game. Um, in this role, I'm a little bit more disconnected from the players, but um, the work is the work is important. And um, it came about when, um, you know, an un unfortunate situation with George Floyd. Um, we felt that we needed to do a better job within the organization of being a little bit more diverse and, and you know, more rounded and inclusive. And um, once this job came up, you know, I jumped on it. And, and now I'm really excited about the future what it holds for the New York Mets. Yeah. And um, do you, do you think, well, you get, well, you know, it's, you guys play, well, you know about history of the game. So you, you know, you both of you can talk about the history of the game and you, so, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't have made it <laughs> if you didn't know a little bit or have some love about the history of the game. But, um, and then also you played in a, a different era you know, when you got yeah. played. Uh, and then what's the difference between, you know, you kind of at the age where you could kind of three different eras, you know, the past, the time you were there, and now is, is there a difference in baseball? I mean, you think there's – is baseball different? Yes, it, it absolutely is. And um, unfortunately, I don't know that everything's for the better. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the um, emergence of analytics has been a great thing. Um, I, I certainly look at the game differently in terms of the, what, what I value. So in, in that respect, um, it's, it's, it's only added to the information, and, and it's a very, very much a good thing. In the process, we've kind of homogenized things. Um, you know, hitters only hit for power. We're only looking for power pitchers. Um, and the game has devolved into what they call the three um, – Donovan, what's the three uh, – re re not real outcomes. There, there's only three outcomes, which is a home run, a walk, or a strike. <laughs> or a strike, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah three absolute outcomes or whatever. And that's it, – it's not the game I grew up with. I don't know – again, it's, 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 an, it's been an evolutionary thing. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody in particular. But – it's not as an exciting a game as, as we grew up with, you know. I think, you know, they, they, if they did a little bit better job with the ball, I, I, I think, I don't think anybody juiced, I, I don't think anybody juiced the ball purposely, but maybe it's just technology that's made, you know, the making of the ball better. But by deadening the ball just a little bit, I think that would help to where the athleticism it comes, in, comes to the floor more. Um, the other thing that bothers me a little bit is, because of the, the, the access to technology that we have, um, we've, you know, the, the ability to think on your own um, is, is kind of lost also. So what you lose is uh, creativity, you know? There are things that, that Tom Glavin or, or Greg Maddox did with the ball that, that um, analytics wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, because they had to figure it out on their own. And I think, especially on the pitching end, that's, that's been lost a little bit too. And that saddens me. Yeah, definitely. I and I and I think that you know, and I've been, you know, and I don't want to say anything against the game, but I really think the shift really hurts a little bit. Um, you're looking at guys who, you know, and everyone says, well, why don't they bunt or why don't they hit the ball the other way? Um, when we were coming up, we were told hit the ball where it's pitched, and now with the shift, pitchers are pitching us towards the shift. So if I'm a left-handed hitter. And now I got three guys on this side of the infield, one playing short right field. And I got a guy like Jacob DeGrom throwing me fastballs and sliders middle in. It's going to be hard for me to hit the ball to the opposite field. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just like in basketball, you have a legal defense. In, in football, you have illegal shifts. Um, in, you know, soccer, you, you know, you have the offsides and all that. I think there should be certain parameters or, or certain rules set up in baseball to where you can't have seven guys on one side of the field and you pitch to that side and tell them to hit the ball the other way. 
to be successful. Um, I, I just think that's, yeah. Personally, that's my part of it that I would rather have changed organically. And being a pitcher, I just want to see, I just want to see those hitters adjust a little bit, you know. Yeah. And the, <laughs> well, you would. <laughs> but, part of, but part of it is the way the way they're coached. It's all about efficiency, you know. And and at some point, and and this is no different than in the NBA lows, where, you know, you shouldn't have to apologize for hitting a single, you know. And it's just like in the NBA, you know, you know, what, what would where where would Alex English be in today's NBA? The the, the great mid range jumper. You know, the Iceman, you know, um, you shouldn't have to apologize for hitting the two. You know, you shouldn't have to apologize. You know, I, I, I love watching Derek Rose because he takes it to the hole, you know, and, and, he, <laughs> and he challenges the defense. But it's not taking it to the hole and automatically kicking it out, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're kicking it out for a guy that's shooting 20 percent from threes, it's boring, you know. Um, and, and, and so technology and, and the, the striving for efficiency doesn't lend itself necessarily to excite, you know? Yeah. And, you know, on uh, one of the, one of the great, uh, I was just having a conversation with some former players that are now coaches in the NBA and, and some individuals I know in the NBA, and they were talking about, you know, trying to find the balance between analytics and identifying whether a guy has the character and the heart to do something that analytics may not pick up, you know, like when you're looking to draft a person, you know, uh, you're drafting that person based on the analytics versus, you know, whether or not that guy is something in a person's heart that brings them to the point where they will not give up on a game or they know how to close a game so that analytics can't tell you. Right. And, and so a number of guys don't get drafted or don't get picked up because, uh, you know, because they don't fit the analytics. And I think there has to be a balance between the heart, the character of a, of a player and the analytics. I think they should work hand in hand, but not one should dominate the other. And, and, and in the NBA in particular, I miss the, um, you know, where the, the big man is devalued. You know, the, the great footwork uh, of, of Akeem, you know, or the beautiful sky book or Mikhail with the up and under, you know, that was, that was beautiful to watch, you know, and I understand it. I three, three points is worth more than two. I get it, you know, but is it more, is it, is it night? Is it more fun to watch? I don't know that it is, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the game is, I guess in every sport is based on entertainment. Who's going to come to the game and who's going to watch the game. So if it's not exciting, if it's not appealing to those who are paying the resources, you know, you can go back in the day with the, the Knicks. I mean, the league was down financially, you know, back in the day. But we we were able to see all the picks. We knew, we knew the first option, second option, third option. We knew who the ball was going to go to. Right now is one on one, draw and kick, pick and roll. There's no play being called. You just give it to one guy, he clears out, and hopefully if he can't get it, he'll throw it to somebody who will make the shot. I mean, so it's a different kind of game. That's that's why I asked the question because, you know, how we – the older we are, we view the game differently, right? And it's hard for me to watch an NBA game all the way through. And I can watch certain teams because they play as a team, and you see that ball move and everybody working together – you know, I I love to see that game that way. So, yeah. yeah. No, it's so hey, look. I I look like you know being a pitcher. I I idolized the great starting pitchers. You know, Tom C. Se- I was a Yankee fan, but Tom Seaver was the guy. And you know, watching those guys get deeper into games, um, and then adjusting as the game was going on. Again, that's something we've lost. And and um, you know, not everybody can do that. I certainly wasn't wasn't good enough to do that. I mean, I had a couple of complete games, but you know. Um, I mean, these, these guys, but the great, the great pitchers were what drew, drew me to the game, you know, and the artistry that they, that they had. Uh, I, I miss that part of it too in baseball. I mean, we have a guy in, in Jake DeGrom and, and I thought of it actually, if you look at what he's done as, as, as many as he's striking out, his pitch counts are actually lower, which is, you know, he, that, that 
one of the 14 strikeout games, she threw 95 pitches, which is mathematically almost impossible. You know? And that's just – as hard as it is to believe, this guy's getting better. It's incredible just watching him pitch. He's just, he just seems like he just has the game – under control and then and then he's getting hits in the game too so it's like man what can't this kid do so uh it's it's exciting it, it is much is it's must watch tv when he's on the mound and um you know i'm glad he's on our side yeah <laughs> we, we might we might actually keep our jobs <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what um you know I remember when I was towards the end of my career, one of the things I always wanted to do in, in baseball and basketball was to master the game. And so as I got older and my and, and my physical skills started, you know, to somewhat diminish, I ended up in the library and I, and I read a book. I, I picked up a book. And of course, my early coach in Boys and Girls Club used to say the game of basketball is 99 after you're in shape and in condition and understand the game, the game is 99.9% .9 mental, right? And I wrote a book, I read a book called Championship Thinking and was talking about all the great thinkers in baseball. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, his name. He passed away, played with San Diego, I think the Padres, right? Um, he was a great hitter. Tony Gwynn? Tony, Tony Gwynn, and I remember the mental, the mental approach to the game that he had. Ted Williams, and they talked a lot about Ted Williams having the ability to slow the ball down and increase the size of it. And you know, he hit over four hundred. And yeah, it, do you see the game today? Is it playing? Is it more mental? I mean, you're just talking about the pitcher. It seemed to be more. His side of it is more mental. You know. I think it has, but I think, again, some of the thinking is being done for you. And I'm not saying that's bad, but but with the access to information, um, you know, guys are given heat heat, um, heat charts of, of where pitchers have, uh, pitch them. Um, these, these kids today go up with so much more information. You know, they really do. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. But – you, you, know, you bring up Tony Gwynn, and Donovan, you could probably speak to this as well. Would Tony Gwynn have been the hitter he was today? Or would they have said to him, no, you got to pull the ball more, you got to hit for more power? You know, I, I suspect that that may have been the case. I, 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 you, I'd like to think a guy as great as that, or Wade Boggs, wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have been tinkered with. You know, and the guy that wouldn't have tinkered with him, that would have appreciated it more than anybody, was Ted Williams, you know? Um, but again, you know, we're, we're, we're putting everybody into a, a, a box and that's, that, that's the part that bothers me, you know, and, and, and actually Tony Gwynn would have been greater today because you certainly couldn't, um, you couldn't shift on him. No, you definitely couldn't shift on him. <laughs> his, his bat to ball skills were off the charts. Uh, yeah. the way he stayed inside the baseball was unbelievable. Um, uh, you know, so, there, so there weren't going to be any shifts with him. No, he, he he was able to put that ball wherever he wanted. It seemed like, uh, you know, he, he used the whole field, and you know, if he wanted to, he could hit for power. And and and, and it's interesting, you know, that question that you're you're saying would would those guys be the same players? Or would they be asked to do something different in, in today's game? And they probably would be. But you know, as good as they are, they probably they would have made those adjustments. Or would or, or would say a guy like Greg Maddox be as good if you gave him a game plan rather than let him be Greg Maddox? Let him let him react to what he sees, as opposed to this is what the way you have to pitch the guy. You know, um, yeah. I always ask I always ask the question I ask him through our analytics guys. What what added value? What added weight do you put on a pitch, a particular pitch, when the hitter thinks something else is coming? That's mm. That can't be calculated, you know, and that's that's pitching. Yeah. yeah. So, so how would you how would you uh or what would you say to uh, somebody? And you know, there's a problem. I'll say this: it's a it's a it's a I pose it's a two pronged question, right? And particularly for African American, I mean, all players, but particularly for African American players that seem to be the numbers have lessened rather than grown in regards to major league baseball right what would you what would you say to convince them you know 
this beautiful game of baseball to keep them in it, you know, keep them uh, have the patience to stay in it. And, 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 you know, and then, you know, how would they train? How would you train them today to, to be uh, baseball players in today's game? I, I think it's important right now that you got to get the kids at an early age. You can't wait till they're high school, high schoolers or, you know, middle schoolers to get them into the game. You know, I learned the game when I was four and five and six years old and it stayed with me. And I, and I found that I had the skills to, to compete. Um, but I think it's really important that you, you have to start to have that father son catch in the backyard. Um, and those are the, and take, take the kids to the games. Um, and then I think it's, it's important. I think major league baseball is addressing it uh, with the players Alliance now. Um, to where you're having more minorities, um, or giving more opportunities to minorities, and I think you got to give them give them more of a chance because you got to think about it. You know, to, you know, to get a real solid baseball glove, those gloves are over a hundred something dollars. The cleats are expensive. The bats, you know, the Eastern bats or whatever they're using now, they're over two hundred, three hundred dollars just to get started. It, it, it costs a lot, so. You think about a kid who, who can say, hey, I don't have the money to do that, or I can go play AU where they're going to give me the uniform. They're probably going to give me the sneakers. They're going to give me this. I can play it for free, basically, compared to playing baseball where the travel, the hotels and all that, it's, it's a tough decision. Um, so I think the Players Alliance is, is going to really try to address some of those needs and some of those issues. And I think Major League Baseball needs to also. Um, we're doing something now with the New York Mets. Where we're doing equipment drives. Where we're giving equipment to little leagues and, you know, really trying to help these, these youth teams uh, that might not have the financial backing. So so these kids can play the game. And I think you have to start with them at a young age. I, I you know, I can only speak to uh, starting at a young age. But Donovan, you're you're so involved in, you know, trying to promote the game and getting getting minorities involved. But but that's so true. We you know, we have to get kids at a young age and and and, and get them. It, it, it's a sport that gets in your blood, um, and and it's a sport of failure too. And that and that makes it difficult to keep the kids. But but that was that's been you know, over, you know that that's always been true. But mm -hmm. But if we get the kids early, I, I, you know, I, I'll give you. When I've talked to guys that that I played basketball with, Mal Vernon, I, uh, I know Joe. People go to listen from Mal Vernon. Let me give a shout out to my boy Lonnie Webb, who I saw just <laughs> um, just uh, write something down there. But uh, Joe Palmer, Joe Palmer caught me caught me in Little League, okay. And I was talking to Joe. We were we were we were somewhere together not not that long ago, and I said, Joe, you, God, I look at you now. You you should have stayed with baseball. You know, not that he wasn't a good basketball player, mm -hmm. he was a heck of a basketball player, but you are a catcher. It, it, you know, finding catchers is so hard. Finding African American catchers is even <laughs> harder. All right, and that you would have, you would have had a full, you would have had money to go to college. Now that's the other thing too, is is scholarship money. Donna, you, you know, yeah. you, again, you can speak on that better than I can. But and Freddie Blake. Freddie Blake would have been a heck of a, of a baseball player. He was. He's a great softball player. But mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things Joe said to me, and I know this is more prevalent today than then, was, Roy, I, I, you know, I love baseball, but if I wanted to make that team in Mount Vernon High, I had to play all summer. I had to. You know, if I wanted, if I wanted to be the starting, uh, starting point guard, um, you know, the starter, which Joe wasn't until his senior year because of all the talent we had, I had to do it. You know, and that and and the way basketball was in Mount Vernon, you know, you know that was that 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 that's the king there. You know, um, I didn't have that. You know, I I had baseball first and then basketball, but I kind of was able to look at it, you know, from from the top down. And what do you say to those kids, Donovan? What do you you know? It's become so specialized now that we've lost the multi-sport athlete. You know, and and that, you know that's true in the other sports, but it it's. It hurts us more because it's such a specialized game. Hitting is really, really hard. You know, you have to hit to hit. You can't just show up, you know. 
And and that is so true. The the specialization of, of a sport. I know that um, I, I I do baseball lessons now, and I had a kid at age thirteen. He was told that hey, you got to make a decision whether you're going to play lacrosse or baseball. Um, and I'm like, at age thirteen, this kid has to make a decision of what he's going to play for the rest of his life. I said, that's not fair. When we were coming up, we played baseball, we played football, we played basketball. I even played soccer. So I I got a chance to play all different sports. And then I realized, okay, as I got to my senior year, I still played the other sports, but I knew that I was really good in baseball and that was where I was going to end up going and, and playing in college. But now some of these kids aren't even touching a baseball or, or, or a basketball or football because they're specializing in one sport. And I think that hurts them. And I think that, you know, I, I look at it now with some of these kids, they're playing baseball January through December with with these indoor facilities, these indoor workouts, and it's the, the winter league, it's the fall league, it's the summer league, and all these kids. And then you you wonder why either kids either get turned off from the game or they end up getting hurt. Yeah. Or, yeah. They, or, or they get burned out. I mean, yeah. well, that, that was one of the things is that one, once my season was over, you know, basketball season was over. We were back in the boys club, right? And and we we did everything in the boys club. We played volleyball, we played football, we we, we did that, you know, everything you could do in the game room. We kind of got away from the game, the, the competitiveness of it. And it gave us an opportunity to get in gym and enjoy just going up and down, playing with your friends, building camaraderie. And, and then the summertime came and you had a, a few weeks of summer league. And then you break from that. I, I think it's overkill right now and, you know, to become a specialist. <laughs> I mean, you, you, know. you, can't, you can't tell me that the skills that you learn in the other sports aren't, aren't you aren't able to use in, in the sport that you're the best at. I, I, I reject that notion. I, I, I talked a little bit about before how playing basketball at Mount Vernon High helped me mentally, um, you know, when uh, later, you know, a little further in my baseball career. Um, and, and, and playing with the high caliber guys, you know, seeing how Scooter and Rodney handled um, the, the, the notoriety that they had, the, um, the fact that they were, they were marked men, you know, which I was on the baseball field. I, I, I took on some of their personality. They, I think about this all the time. I never talked to my opponents when I played baseball. Where did I get that? Part of that was because both those guys, both the, the, the two brothers were quiet. And we kind of took, as a team, we took um, – that, that personality on, you know, um, coach Rick Shore, who, who Lowe's played for was as disciplined a coach as I've ever played for. And how many times did he say to me, Roy, do what you do best, do what you do best. Well, later on, I'm hearing that from Doc Edwards in AAA when I started to struggle. Let's, let's constantly, I, I had heard it before, but it was from a different sport in a different, in a different way, but it still applied. Jake DeGrom, you can't tell me that he isn't as great as he is partially because he played shortstop in college you know that the, the, that overall athletic skills the ability for him to adjust the how in tune he is with his body and, and the ability to make adjustments that overall athleticism applies to is universal yeah yeah definitely. you know and i and I, I think of it now it's like would i really have enjoyed baseball if i had played january through december there's no way you know? I, I think I would have I would have got tired of the sport. I remember in high school we had 18 games. We got rained out. There's a good chance we weren't going to make it up. So those games I cherished. And then it was off to soccer. It was off to ba uh, to basketball. And I couldn't wait to get back to baseball. But I think right now with these kids playing so many games, if I screw up in a game, no big deal. I got another game tomorrow. Some of these kids are playing major league schedules. They're playing a hundred and something games as youth. And I'm like, wow, you know, what would I have done if I had a hundred games a year and then train in January and December and November? I think I would have got burnt out and it wouldn't have been as fun. Well, you yeah. know, the thing is that that body of work that you're putting on your physical body at that time, somewhere down the road is going to hit it's going to impact you it's like a 30 year old guy is not a 30 year old guy anymore. i mean his oh. body is older because he's put so much so much mileage on it 
And, exactly. and then sometimes you start to see these guys, you know, particularly you say, oh, but well, they only played one year, like in, in college basketball. They only played one year of college basketball and they went to the pros and all of a sudden somebody's injured. Right. But you, you're not counting the, the hundreds of games they played in AAU. Right. Because yeah. everything is always winning, 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 winning. Right. And there's never a time where the game be- is fun. I mean, I, you know, like you said, I think Roy said earlier, and I think when I when I was younger, right, um, when I was playing baseball, it was something I enjoyed. Right. I, it was hard, but I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I had fun with the guys I was around. I was trying to get better. The coaches were good coaches. They were giving us good instructions. But I, I, I enjoyed baseball. Right. And, and then same thing in basketball. I, I really enjoyed it. I don't know that many, many people today. You know, I would ask the question, how many of them, is it a business or do you really have love for the game? My daughter coaches uh, college basketball, you know, assistant Mm -hmm. college basketball. And I, and I was talking to her about recruiting. Right. And I was saying, you know, I think it's going to be hard because you can't analyze it. Right. You can't analyze how much somebody loves something. Right. But you have to find people who, love the game who want to go work out you ain't got to tell them to go <laughs> they just automatically they just automatically go and and because they love the game they they're gym rats they in they're playing baseball they're throwing the ball they're catching the ball they want somebody to do it with them and you know those are the kind of kids that really love it not because they look down the road and i'm gonna make a million dollars or i'm gonna be famous and you know all those things you know i i always tell people that you have to if you truly love it, you also love the bad part. You know, um, you know, I, I used to, there was so long through my career and, and even in little league, I was always nervous before I pitched, but I never didn't love it. You know, I, I didn't want anybody else on the mound, but I, I was always nervous, but I realized that that, that nervousness once channeled was a good thing, you know, because it, 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 it and, um, like what I said about loving the bad stuff, it, it can't, it can't just be when things are going good, you know, and again, I look back and I, I, especially when I was in the big leagues, I always wish I was better where I wouldn't feel as nervous. I, w- I wouldn't feel on, on as on edge. And yet when it's over, that's what you miss. You miss that living on the edge feeling. And I realized that I love, I actually loved it more than I, I realized I did. that even, even when I got sent down or I had a bad start, I relished the challenge of coming back. It seemed like a chore on the t- at the time, but I didn't realize how much I missed it when it was over. You know, um, that nervousness. There's nothing that replicates that. Really, nothing. You know. And again, I don't have children. Donovan, you know, the joy of seeing your son. You know, probably I would imagine. Uh, you know, is better than anything. But <laughs> that I don't know that I. And, and I did worry about that when it, when it was all over. And, and I and I. And I wasn't even that good. I, I can only imagine what the stars go through, uh, you know, that are so addicted to it, you know. And, and I, I I understand what that addiction is like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, I don't know. Did we did we play against each other, Donovan? Uh, we, we played in uh, with uh, Danny Burns, <laughs> three on three. Uh, Yes, we did. Yes, we did. We played against each other. Here I am. Here I am, never playing higher than high school basketball, and here I am sticking low the floor. <laughs> hey, Rose, I was at the uh, I was at the game when you hit you hit the last second shot against uh, Yonkers at, at County Center. That was you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah. That, was that was some scene after the game, man. Yeah. <laughs> Guys were jumping off the uh, the. the, 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 the uh, Madison Square Garden, man. We were like, uh, uh, gee, you know. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never Everybody forget that. Screaming. Yeah. But that, that was fun, you know, going in there, playing a little three-on-three, raising some money for – for, for uh, That, was, that, that was fun for you. That was more for me? <laughs> that was fun for you. <laughs> I think I think in the four games we played, I might have scored four points. <laughs> but you was out there, man. Yeah, struggling. <laughs> you was out there, I, you know, and I've been out there – Again, most of us probably played a little a little baseball, so we got a 
not that we were good. It was just a sense that we knew what to do. So I, I played in a couple of, you know, softball games or baseball games, you know, after I was playing, uh, you know, basketball and, you know, some of that stuff pops back in your head, but you're not very good. <laughs> now, Donovan, Donovan, let me ask you something. What, when, yeah. when things got tough for your son, um, was there ever a point where he became frustrated with basketball or, you know, maybe went through a shooting slump or something, And especially in high school where, again, he's a marked man and, and that pressure of, of having to perform? Um, did that ever get to him? Did, he ever, did you ever reach a point where, you know, you know, I had to sit down with him and have a talk. You know, he he's he's self motivated, which which I which I love about him and his work ethic is is you know is is unbelievable. It's funny because um there were two times that I remember where he didn't play very well, and we we um one time it was at Louisville and we ended up going over the uh, and you know they have that 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 rebound machine where it kicks the ball back out. So I, I remember sitting in the gym watching him shoot 600 shots um, because he wanted to get himself back on track. And then um, I think it was two years ago, they opened the season against um, Golden State. And I think I think he scored 19 points, but he didn't have like a great shoot night. And um, I thought we were going to go to dinner after the game. We got in the car and we went right over to the practice facility. And this is, this is after opening night. And we were in there till almost 2 in the morning. And I'm out there playing. I had shoes on. I'm out there playing, putting my hand up, you know, trying to, you know, play some defense on him so he could work on his shot. So he's always been self-driven, um, self-motivated. Um, sometimes I felt he, he'd be a little bit too hard on himself, but, um, he, he has a great head on his shoulders and, um, he, I don't think he's ever really gotten to that point where the game's really kicked his butt that much. And, and I'm, and I hope he never has to really go through that. I went through it as a baseball player. Um, in 1994, I was playing in the Florida state league and I think I was hitting 187 uh, at the half point. Um, and just couldn't couldn't get out of my own way, um, and and those those are the times where, you know, you try to lean on you know past experiences, and I ended up finishing the year at two forty to where I really got myself going. But you know that I remember that to this day. And then the next year I ended up uh, leading the league and hitting at three twenty five. But it's the like you said, it's the it's the times where you really struggle that you know kind of build that character. And I think whenever he's gone through his struggles it's always built his character and he's always uh, tried to prove that he's better than um, that bad night. And usually comes out uh, and has, has a good guy, good game or good, good night the next night. Right. Let me, I got a couple more questions for you guys before we get off here. And I, I want to make a statement too, because you guys, um, yeah, you really dropped some nuggets. And I always say that on every show, I always mention my grandfather saying, come here, son, man, uh, you know, I want to give you this nugget, right? And I'm like, what? I'm looking for something in the hand, but he really wasn't going to give me anything. He was trying to give me some advice, right? And uh, Dame Lillard and I uh, guess Kevin Love on the insurance commercial dropping dimes. You guys dropped a lot of nuggets tonight and a lot of, of dimes, particularly was powerful earlier when you were talking about family. And, you know, if you're, if you're out there and you – um, want to play sports or you're in sports, there's a risk and reward. You know, there's, you know, uh, there's benefits in, in sports and then there, you know, there's some non-benefits in regards to potentially in sports, everybody can get hurt. And, you know, I know a lot of great players who got hurt in the beginning of their career, in the middle of their career, and that's, you know, that's a risk and their great reward. I mean, you know, opportunity to be successful, famous, hopefully get some resources and stuff like that. But there are some others, some some things like they like uh, Roy mentioned and Donovan mentioned in regards to, yeah, being on that stage, traveling, being on television, but missing family, man. I think that was a very powerful uh, nugget that we have to think about, man, that how much time we spend away from our families, right? Yeah. 
you know, how much I'm I'm at playing with the Clippers in San Diego. My mother's in New York. I, you know, my mother never missed a game in high school, <laughs> you know. Uh, and you think about I went to West Virginia University. I didn't go to St. John's, although I wasn't recruited by St. John's. But, you know, I didn't go to St. John's. So my mother couldn't come around the corner and see me. So occasionally she got a chance. Becoming successful, there's some benefits, right? And then there's some some be- not so good benefits, you know, not like family, you know, not being able to to be there, see your family grow up and different things like that. But is there, and I know Donovan mentioned um, a person, but is there a person outside of your family um, that impacted you? For me, for me, it was my my high school baseball coach James Robinson. Um, you know, he he was him up there. He, he was uh, he was in my life um, as as a father figure. And and the good thing about it was, um, you know, he he treated me. He knew he kind of knew what what I was going through without having uh, my mom there um, full time and not having my dad there full time. So. You know, he, he kind of took me under under his wing and, and 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 pretty much helped me with my recruiting and everything else. So that's the guy. And and when you when you think about what you were going through, what I was going through as a as a as a young kid, um, the community really helped me held me down. Uh, Elmsworth really helped me down. And and when it, when the times got tough that we talked about, boy. Um, I will lean on James, but I also looked at all the people in the community uh, who who were there for me. Um, when I really wanted to walk away from the game, I, I, I kind of looked at, you know what, I'm, I'm representing the community who who saw me in the park playing ball, who were always there encouraging me. I can't walk away. I kind of owe it to them to to do my best and, and to, to work hard. But you know that one person who who was always there uh, was James, and and you know I, I owe him a lot. I thank him a lot. Yeah, that's not the James Robinson. Uh, Robinson. That is the James Robinson from Greenberg. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> we were rivalries growing up, you know. My <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, yeah. The I know he's over there. He can't get his. He can't put that hat on his head right now. You know. He probably got a cigar, got his leg crossed. Yeah, that's my man right there. You know? <laughs> uh, Roy, what about you? Well, I, I'll uh, people who listen from Mount Vernon will recognize these two names. O- other than my father, who's easily the, the greatest influence uh, in my life, and again, he passed away when I was nineteen. But you know, it, it was it's not a day that goes by I don't think about him. But um, for me, uh, luckily. At eight years old, when I when I first played organized baseball, Frank Bartolotta was was my first coach, right. and he was an ex scout and unbelie- un- unbelievable ability to teach the game, you know. And and you know the first organized game I ever played, that was my coach. So in terms of learning the game, he was the greatest influence. My greatest coach, not my best, not necessarily my best baseball coach, although he was a big great baseball coach, was Tony Fiorentino. And I say that because he knew what made me tick and held always held me to a high standard. You know, um, great coach, great fundamental coach, and a great basketball coach, greater basketball coach. Great with the fundamentals. And, you know, to be a good coach, not only do you have to have the knowledge, you have to be able to convey it. And he, he could put things in very simple terms. So, you know, his impact on me in terms of baseball wasn't as great, but in basketball – yeah, I learned the concepts very easily because of the way he put it. But you know, he never yelled at me. Whenever, whenever he got, whenever he got annoyed at me, when I would get cranky on the mound and maybe get mad at the umpires or something like that, he would always tell me, "You're better than that. You, you are better than that." And you have, you have, and and that that maybe hurt me more than than if he had yelled at me. You know. Yeah. And uh, my final question before we get off here. First of all, I want to say thank you guys for coming on, taking time on your busy schedule and coming on. I um, uh, appreciate it. Uh, the final question is, you know, it. I'm sure there's a parent or there's some young person out there listening. What, what advice would you give them, a young person today? 
it, you're talking about in, in sports or just in general? <laughs> it, I, I would say sports and in general, yeah, because um, you know not everybody's gonna go, gonna play sports. You know, you know they're gonna go. They're gonna be a pro in something else. <laughs> but they did. One of the things I always say, and I was talking to some parents today about school. Um, and one of the kids was talking about, well, my mom and dad, you know, want me to go here. And I said, you know, you got to realize that, you know, you're going to be at this school for four years. Mom and dad aren't going to be there for four years. This is, this is your life. And this is the beginning of your life. So, you know, mom and dad might want you to go somewhere, but you got to go somewhere where you're comfortable. I would say to the parents, as well as the kids, Whatever you do, whatever the kid's going to do, you got to realize that you're all in this together. Um, your kid's going to be leaning on you for advice. He's going to lean on you for this. It's a stressful time for them. So I would say that you're all in this together. So decisions need to be made together. But ultimately, that kid has to make his decision as far as where he wants to go. And it's a, it's got to be a family decision, but sometimes you have to kind of let, let your child find his way and you can guide and, and tell him everything. Sometimes they're going to have to find out on their own, but you have to be there to support and, and be there for them. So everything that your child's going to do, it's a family decision. It's, it's a family thing. We're all in this together. Just like when I went away to play baseball, even though it was me playing baseball, my community was there with me. It's a family decision. And I would say that you guys need to, Families need to have that talk before things are done. And if a kid decides that, hey, I'm going to play this sport, you got to understand there's going to be travel. There's going to be so many other things. It's a family thing. And I know that because when Don was playing basketball, Jordan was in the car going to those games. So she signed up for something that she didn't know she was going to sign up for. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a family decision. Yeah. Really? Um, well, again, not having kids, I'm kind of, it's always been a little bit of a struggle, even when I talk to kids, but I, I'd say two things again, what my father drummed into my sister and I create as many options as you can. Um, so you, you're able to do things because you want to do them, not because you have to. And I'll give you the other lesson I learned in a quick story. Um, Bobby, Cino you know, actually had tickets to Bill Bradley night, uh, at the garden and he called me up. I was probably the 10th guy he called, but. He had an extra ticket, and I wanted to go in the worst way. And I said, yeah, yeah pick me up. And you know, I lived in, in Fleetwood. So pick me up. I can't wait. And then I, then I put down the phone. I had a fine, I had a, a midterm, no, a final at Fordham the next day. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll just wake up in the morning and I'll, I'll study, you know, everything like that. And the more I thought about it, again, my father wasn't around then. My mother certainly wasn't going to yell at me or anything. I was in my, my early 20s because I was playing baseball. I think I was 20. I was the one writing out the check for my college education. I, I literally wrote out a check. And I thought to myself, the only guy I'm hurt if I do bad on that test is me. Mm. You know, it's not about pleasing your parents. It's not about pleasing others. It's about you. And the quicker you learn that, the quicker you, you know, the, actually the harshness of life, that, that cold reality, it was so simple. But it hit me like a ton of bricks. I, if I do bad on that test, nobody, nobody's going to be yelling at me. Nobody is. I'm, I'm not letting anybody down, but myself. I'm making an investment in myself. That's why I'm going to school. And I called Bobby back and I said I can't make it. But it, it, it's so simple. It, it, I feel dumb, but that's when it hit me that I'm on my own, and I have to, you know, I have to, I have to like myself, you know. Right. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you, man. Um, that, that was good advice, man. I appreciate you guys. Take, again, like I said earlier, I appreciate you guys taking the time. I enjoyed it. Right. I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, made me go back and think about baseball and how much I really enjoyed it and, and how much uh, my my grandfather impacted me in regards to the game and how he put that competitive spirit in me to work hard at whatever I put my hands to. And it, it was just awesome talking to you guys tonight, man. Um, hey, bring us a championship here with the Mets. <laughs> and, man, we, we'll be all good. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, well, that'd man. be nice. That would be nice. Thanks, Lowe's, for having us. Thank All you. Right. I, I really enjoyed it. Donovan, I'll see you in the office, buddy. Definitely. All right. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your support again of the Blueprint. I uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, we enter May. That's going to be my birthday month. I'm going to get a little bit older next uh, in May. And and I'm, I want to have a, uh, sh some shows that talk about uh, wealth, and creativity and i'm going to have some individuals on my good friend hugo king i you know i call hugo and there's never if i'm feeling bad i'm gonna call hugo <laughs> i'm gonna call hugo because no matter how bad i'm feeling he's gonna give me something positive i mean he's gonna he's, he's gonna turn that thing around for me and I'm, he's gonna be on next week and he's gonna talk about some great stuff so i look forward to seeing you next week god bless you and have a wonderful wonderful evening we really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's More, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's More and on Facebook at Lowe's More Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the kitchen is a joke, I ain't buying it like I'm broke. It's sufficient fun for